Good evening. Did y'all like the snow? Did you think you were gonna get class off? No, I'm the mean headmaster. Uh, so this evening we have Dr. Amy Walkner. After graduating magna cum laude from the University of Notre Dame, Dr. Walkner completed her medical education at the Jefferson Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University, where she was in the top quintile of her graduation class and remained for both her internship and residency in internal medicine. She was then a fellow in endocrinology, diabetes and metabolism at the George Washington University Medical Center. She joined Christiana Care Endocrinology Specialists in August of 2008. She is actively engaged in the medical group of Christiana Care as the clinical leader in endocrinology. In this role, she collaborates with other subspecialties and primary care physicians within the medical group and with the goal of providing each patient efficient and exceptional care. She treats all types of endocrine disorders with a focus on type 1 and type 2 diabetes with the use of insulin pumps and sensors, thyroid cancer and other thyroid disorders, osteoporosis and PCOS. She partners with her patients in the hopes that each patient achieves, uh, achieves their health goals. And I will say relative to the insulin pumps and sensors, she brought some really cool stuff uh, along with her that hopefully we'll have time at the end of her official presentation to uh, let some of you uh, see it as the class is probably large enough tonight that we can't pass it around uh, to everybody and just make sure you don't inadvertently walk out with it. Well, you know, the alarms will go off. So anyway, at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Walker to you. Thank you for that great inter introduction. I'm really happy to be here tonight. I've really enjoyed kind of preparing for this talk because it took me, you know, back to the times before we had all these different tools to treat our patients and um, took me back to a time where we didn't even have insulin and we were working on discovering insulin and discovering all the pills and all the tools we have today to treat our, uh, our diabetes patients. So. It, it really helped me when I see my patients today, I, I definitely am more appreciative of all the tools that we have to be able to help them. Um, I would like to start my talk with just a little bit of background information about diabetes. Um, I don't know if everyone in the room knows, but diabetes is pretty much an epidemic in America right now. There are 30 million people in America, or about 10% of the adult population with diabetes. Now, most of that diabetes, 90%, is type 2 diabetes. And the risk factors for that are obesity, sedentary lifestyle, and you know, genes also play a role. Um, it's typically diagnosed in adulthood, but as obesity is on the rise, we are seeing younger and younger cases of it. Now, type 1 diabetes is a very distinct disorder and much different from type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes represents about 10% of all diabetes. And type 1 diabetes is diagnosed in childhood. Um, it can be diagnosed in infancy. And the, it's typically a lean individual and is not an obese individual. And the treatment is very much different. While you can use insulin to treat type 2 diabetes, it's generally treated through diet and lifestyle modification, and then pills if you need them, um, and then maybe insulin if you need that too. But in type 1 diabetes, it's a disorder where you have to take insulin several times a day. It involves a lot of monitoring of your blood sugar, a lot of decisions about how to dose insulin, and insulin is typically dosed four times a day. Given that insulin is a protein hormone, we cannot take it by mouth because if we did, it would get digested within the digestive juices within the stomach and the small intestine. Therefore, it is only being able to be dosed through a subcutaneous injection. So you can imagine what a life changer that would be for a family with a small child or an infant to be diagnosed uh, with diabetes. It is definitely a life changer. So with that background information, we're going to start with my talk, and I did change the title. I, I tried to make it a little bit more me, I guess I would say, 
So it's diabetes, we've come a long way, baby. And so when I initially made the talk, I, I was thinking that, you know, we've come a long way and then added the baby, I was thinking more like Austin Powers, like, yeah, baby, yeah. I don't, does that speak to anyone in the group here? Okay, but um, that's the line that I was going with. But then when I was trying to pull a photo of Austin Powers, I typed in Google, um, we've come a long way, baby. And I saw something very different there, and I bet a lot of people in this room, it seems to me that maybe about 50% would know what came up when I typed in that. And there was a Loretta Lynn song that came out in 1979 entitled, We've Come a Long Way, Baby. So you learn something new every day. So I appreciated, you know, I'm a music lover. I'm, I'm into more pop country than old school country, but I was, I was happy to learn something new. So. Whether or not you're a Loretta Lynn or an Austin Powers person, I hope you, you enjoy my talk. So diabetes has been known about since ancient times. So diabetes has been affecting our lives for thousands of years. Egyptian manuscripts dis describe diabetes um, back in 1550 BC. And it was recognized when people began to have excessive thirst and urination. And it was actually termed the pissing evil. That was its initial description. And then Apollonius of Memphis, around 250 BC, coined the term diabetes mellitus. And it's made up of the Latin word diabetes, which means siphon or to pass through, and the Greek word mellitus, which means honeyed or sweet. So in, from 1735 to 1784, there were several discoveries being made, and Matthew Dobson is the one that's, that's basically credited with the discovery that people with diabetes are sweeter than other people. In fact, their urine and their blood is sweet tasting, and they did taste it back then. But there was also a study that involved if you allowed urine to evaporate, you let it sit out for long enough, what would you see? you would see sugar crystallizing within the urine. So we've known about that since the, the 1700s. So skip forward about 100 years, there was a German medical student by the name of Paul Langerhans, and what he was doing was looking at pancreases under the microscope. And what he noticed was that there were two types of cells within the pancreas. There were the acinar cells that secrete digestive enzymes, they're part of exocrine pancreatic function, or the function of digestion. And that made up most of the pancreas, right? But interspersed among those cells were also these other blobs of cells, or islands within the pancreatic tissue. So like any good person that discovered something, he decided to name it after himself, right? The islets of Langerhans. So that is what we call these cells that live in the pancreas. And we found out later that these cells are the cells that produce insulin. So the islets of Langerhans have two types of cells within them. They have the beta cells, which make insulin, and the alpha cells, which make glucagon. So insulin lowers blood sugar, and glucagon raises blood sugar. So in 1889, it was thought that diabetes was a kidney disorder. Right? People were urinating frequently with the disorder. It was called the pissing evil. Well, actually, Joseph von Mehring and Oskar Minkowski discovered that if you removed a pancreas, not the kidney, from a dog, that dog would begin to have excessive urination, and that dog would be excessively thirsty, and that dog would also lose weight. So we began to think in 1889 that diabetes was a pancreas problem and not a kidney problem. That takes us to this, this group here. So that lovely dog is named Lucy. That dog is one of the few dogs that survived the experiments of these, these, two, these two people here. But these two people are people that changed the lives of, of my patients. And so I, I want to describe to you a little bit behind this picture. So over here, we have Frederick Banting. Now, Dr. Banting was a surgeon practicing in Ontario in the 1920s. And unfortunately uh, for him, in, and fortunately for my patients, in 1920, surgeons were not paid much money. And so to get a little extra cash, Dr. Banting decided to 
do some teaching at a local medical school. It was in his preparation to give a talk about the pancreas that he uh, began to formulate some ideas about a way to study the pancreas and diabetes. So his thought was if you removed the pancreas from a dog, and for the dog lovers in the audience, I apologize, but this work was done many years ago, and Lucy did survive, so that was good. But um, if you remove the dog from a pancreas and you could isolate the cells that produced insulin and pull out the extract or insulin and then give it back to a diabetic dog, could you then reverse the condition of diabetes? So that was his thought. And he went to the University of Toronto professor, the professor in physiology by the name of John McLeod, who was doing experiments at the time looking at sugar in the urine. And he went to Dr. McLeod and he said, you know, I have this idea. I want to do this research ex experiment. Can you give me your lab space and can you, can you give me some help and can you give me some dogs? And Dr. McLeod was pretty skeptical, but he did say yes. And he loaned Dr. Banting, this young man right here, who's Charles Best, who was a research assistant at the time. So in the summer of 1922, they began their experiments. And I will say that they did lose several dogs along the way. Again, sorry for the dog lovers. But at the, the end result was they were able to extract insulin out of a, a dog's pancreas and give it back to a diabetic dog and basically reverse the condition. So after they made that discovery, they, they were right near a university hospital, um, University of Toronto General Hospital. And in that hospital, there were young people basically dying from diabetes. So at that time, there was a 14-year-old patient by the name of Leonard Thompson who weighed 65 pounds and was severely malnourished because at that time, the only way to treat diabetes was to really reduce your calories and reduce your sugar intake. So they went to the bedside of um, Leonard Thompson's hospital bed, and they gave him his first insulin injection in January, on January 11th, 1922. And everyone was very excited, but unfortunately that first injection did not do much. Leonard Thompson didn't really perk up or show any signs that that shot was of value. So they went back to the lab, and they looped in a, another physiologist by the name of Bert Carlip. They looped him in, and what his role was is he was able to purify the insulin so that you were only getting insulin, and when you injected it, it would, have, it would have a far greater effect. So they went back to Leonard Thompson's bedside and gave him the second insulin injection. And the results were dramatic. He derived a great benefit. He started to feel better. He got several insulin shots. He was having less sugar in the urine, which was the way to measure the glucose at the time. And you can see here Leonard Thompson with his mother in January of 1922. And then in July, you can see the dramatic difference, right? There was, you know, a little bit of chubby cheeks, and he looks much more well-nourished, albeit he's still fairly, fairly tiny from all, all the times he spent uh, with the high sugar. So in March of 1922, Banting and Best published their findings. And then, as you can imagine, it hit the, it hit the media circuit, right? Initially getting press in Toronto, and the Toronto Daily Star saying, Toronto doctors on track of diabetes cure. And one of the other quotes was, Toronto doctors have robbed diabetes of its terrors. So really, really dramatic stuff. And as you can see here, we had the first insulin. And these were the guys that discovered insulin back in 1922. Uh, Dr. Banting and Dr. McLeod, the one who gave the lab and the dogs and the research assistant, uh, later won the Nobel Prize, and an interesting story was they won that together, and so when Banting was told he won the Nobel Prize, he was like, with McLeod, he was like, well, well why does McLeod get it? I'm going to share my award with, with Charles Best, who was my research assistant, and McLeod said, well, if you're going to do that, I'm going to be mad too, and I'm going to share my reward with uh, Dr. Carlip. So there was a little contention there with the Nobel Prize. So then in 1936, just about 10 years later, 10, 15 years later, Harold Hemsworth distinguishes between the two types of diabetes. And what he noticed was some people needed a little insulin and some people needed a lot of insulin. And so he defined the terms then 
as insulin sensitive, think type 1 diabetic, and insulin insensitive, think type 2 diabetic. So what is diabetes? I'm just going to go back through this. I know I mentioned it in the beginning. But diabetes, as defined by the American Diabetes Association, is a group of metabolic diseases characterized by hyperglycemia revol resulting from defects in insulin secretion, insulin action, or both. So insulin secretion, think type 1 diabetes. Insulin action, think insulin resistance or both, because there are times where these, these cross. So I don't know why I titled this, this, this slide defect. That was an error on my part. This is a slide depicting insulin action. So in the middle, the blue part is a cell. So what does insulin do? Insulin binds to the insulin receptor, which allows a key to go into its hole. And when you have the right key in the right hole and you turn it, you're going, to have glu you're going to have a glucose channel get to the tip of the cell, and glucose is going to go into the cell so that cell can function normally. So in type 2 diabetes, you're making a lot of insulin, but this connection is not working well, such that you don't open the door to the cell and the glucose doesn't go in. In type 1 diabetes, you're just not making <coughs> enough insulin, and so this process doesn't work either in that regard. So type 1, again, not enough insulin production, childhood, a lean person, four shots a day of insulin as a minimum. Another use or tool that we have, and we'll talk about it later in this discussion, is the insulin pump. And I did bring some, some examples of that for during the intermission or afterwards. It is a very labor-intensive disease. Um, so how do you dose your insulin at mealtime? Um, basically, you look at all the carbohydrates on your plate. You've got to count them and measure them. And then you look at your carbs, and you divide carbs by a number, and that gives you your mealtime dose. You also, before the meal, check your blood sugar. And if your blood sugar is high, you do a calculation so that you take insulin to correct the high. So you take correct in, correction insulin and insulin for the food. It's a lot of work. And it's a lot of math, actually. So if you're not good at math, you do struggle a little bit with this disease. And we'll give, get more into this part of it in, in just a little bit. But here's an example of what a type 1 di diabet diabetic patient needs to deal with. So if we look at this graph here, you can see the gray lines as sugar, right, and time of day. So a typical breakfast, a typical lunch, and a typical dinner. So when we eat our breakfast, we have a spike in blood sugar, and then it comes down again. We eat our lunch, we have a spike. We eat our dinner, we have a spike. So how we counteract those spikes is we take a short-acting insulin before the meal that prevents that spike. That's called a bolus of insulin. And we also take a long-acting shot of insulin, or a background or basal insulin, that gives us a steady stream of insulin to counteract our body's production of sugar when we're not eating. So what, is in, what goes on in type 2 diabetes? Your body is resistant to insulin. So the typical scenario is a patient that sh has struggled with their weight and then also has maybe some genes predisposing them to diabetes. And over the years, unbeknownst to them, their sugar has been running just a little bit high. And their pancreas has been working overtime to deal with this slightly high blood sugar. And they're producing insulin and producing insulin, but their body is resistant to it. That connection between the key and the keyhole is not being made, right? And over time, you know, that gets worse and worse. Sugars get higher and higher, and then that's when we need to use pills, and later down the line we might use insulin. And of course, the, the cornerstone of treatment is diet and exercise. Um, and there are studies showing if you lose just 5 to 10 percent of your body weight, you may be able to reverse your diabetes or certainly control it a lot better. So lifestyle changes are, are cornerstone in type 2 diabetes. So back to our story. So it's basically the, the summer now of 1923. We've discovered insulin. Uh, in the lab in Canada, and what happens next? We got a lot of publicity, which was great, 
But the best part of it all is that immediately after those, that discovery, or at least in a quick, quick time frame by today's standards, insulin was then being mass produced to get the insulin to the people. So there was no red tape, no wait, let me see how this does and study it for 10 years before it gets FDA approval. No, we made a life-changing discovery and let's bring this insulin to the people. So the Eli Lilly company um, began producing insulin sh right back in 1923, soon after this discovery was made, which to me is, is one of the most remarkable pieces to the story. So the early insulin preparations um, were not from dogs, because there were dog lovers back then, just as there are today. And there are probably people that are not happy about how they actually did get the insulin. But they did get it from um, uh, animals that were going to the slaughterhouse. So it was primarily from cow and uh, pork sources. Um, you extracted insulin from their pancreases. Um, you could also do um, some things to it. Back in the 1930s, you could add a zinc molecule and a protamine molecule to change the action profile as well. So typical human insulin starts working in about 30 minutes and it's out of your body in six hours. So what they could do if they added a zinc and a protamine, they could change the action profile to more like 12 to 18 hours. And that was great because as we saw in the original slide going back to the University of Toronto General Hospital, kids were affected by diabetes and kids always do better uh, to get a lot of sleep. So you didn't have to wake them up several times a night to, to be dosing their insulin once we were able to extend the action profile of insulin. So what about oral diabetes drugs? Um, many of my patients have a plate that looks like this. I'm not responsible for all the medications on the plate. Typically. Um, my type 2 uh, diabetes patients are also taking cholesterol and blood pressure medication, but a lot of times their plates do look like that. And um, we're going to go through some of, some of the drugs and the discoveries that were made in the treatment of type 2 diabetes uh, going forward. So in 1946, uh, the sulfonylureas were discovered by Marcel Hambone and co-workers. And what they were doing at the time was looking at sulfonamide antibiotics. And they realized if you uh, removed the compound sulfonylurea and gave it um, to a person or an animal, you would cause hypoglycemia. So 1946, we had our initial sulfonylureas, initially on the market as glyburide, then came glipizide, then came glimepiride. And these are very handy diabetes drugs. They're very good at lowering blood sugar. The problem is, is once you take them, uh, they're working in your body regardless. So if you decide to skip a meal or you're more active or you eat less, you could have hypoglycemia. They're going to work the same way no matter what, and they don't care what you're doing that might lead to hypoglycemia. So you kind of got to be a little careful with this drug. The other thing is it's associated with weight gain, which is something we're trying to avoid in a type 2 diabetes patient. The next drug that was discovered was also in the 1940s, was the biguanide class of anti-diabetic drugs. And they were discovered from the French lilac, uh, a medicine that had been used in folk medicine for several centuries. The first iteration of this drug was termed uh, glucophage, actually sugar eater. So those marketing people that work for the junk drug companies were doing great work even back in 1940. Um, however, in the 1970s, that class of drug was taken off the market due to concerns of lactic acidosis. So we had this great diabetes drug that came out, and unfortunately, it got pulled off the market due to concerns of a rare side effect. Um, how metformin works, or sugar eater, or glucophage, or the biguanide class, is that it inhibits glucose output from the liver, and it also helps your insulin work better. It helps your insulin tell the cells to take up more sugar. It fights insulin resistance. And the, one of the nice things about metformin is that it's weight neutral, and even in some studies, it does cause weight loss. But again, on the market in 1940s, off the market in the 1970s. So we're still in the 1970s, and in 1977, Boston researchers developed a test to measure glycosylated hemoglobin, or hemoglobin A1C. So what this test does is it measures sugar attached to a red blood cell. A red blood cell lasts about three months. 
And if you have a high A1C, it means lots of sugar floating around and lots of glucose attached to the red blood cell. If you have a low A1C, not so much glucose attached to the red blood cell. And that test, discovered in the 1970s, is a test we use day in and day out and we talk about every day with both our type 1 and our type 2 diabetes patients. So it gives us a three-month look back on how the patient is doing with their diabetes. So if you have an A1C of 12%, that's an average blood sugar of 345, and that's too high. If you have an A1C of 7, that's an average blood sugar of 170, and that's pretty good. Um, we've also come over the past 10 years to be able to use this test as a diagnostic tool. So if I want to screen someone that does not have diabetes, I can run a hemoglobin A1C, and if it's 5.7 to 6.4, you're considered pre-diabetic, and if you're 6.5 and above, you're considered diabetic. So I, I mentioned some numbers here. So what is good blood sugar control? So if you're fasting in the morning and you're anywhere between 80 and 120, that's a good number. Anytime after a meal, if you keep it less than 140 or less than 180, depends on who you ask, the American Diabetes Association versus the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, they set their targets a little different. So if you're less than 180, two hours after a meal, you're doing a good job. So in 1982, the FDA approves human insulin to be produced in microorganisms. Now remember, to this point, we were actually extracting uh, the insulin from uh, cattle and pork sources. So now we were able to start making it ourselves. So two companies began to make human insulin in bacteria. In the case of Eli Lilly, they used E. coli. And then in the case of Novo Nordisk, uh, they used baker's yeast. And now we could produce insulin within the lab. We no longer had to get it from animal sources. So in 1985, that was when the first insulin pens came out. And these are really handy things. And, and if you want, um, after the talk, you can come and take a look at these. But basically, within this pen, you have a reservoir, which has all the insulin in it, which is like from here to here. You also have a knob where you can dial in your insulin dose and you can see you know, how much you're giving yourself. You turn the knob. You have a little needle cap that you just you know, pull the cap off and put it on top and twist it on. Um, take off the, the top cap. Now you have a little needle on top of your pen and you have insulin within here. And when you want to give a dose, you just dial in the back of the dose. I just dialed up to 64 units. And you literally go under your skin and press a button on the top with your thumb, and you've dosed yourself insulin. Now, as you can imagine, this was incredibly helpful for small kids or people dosing insulin before meals because, you know, you could just have this in your pocket or in your purse. And it was much more discreet and easy, easy to be able to take your insulin prior to meals which is where you know, three of the shots of a, of a four times a day regimen come. They're just before the meal. So it made things w much more convenient. Shortly thereafter, we had a landmark trial in 1993. Now, before you look at this graph, let me just describe the complications of diabetes. If you have a hemoglobin A1C that stays high, it means high sugar in the bloodstream. And over time, over the course of years, this damages your body. What part of the body does it damage? It damages the small blood vessels. So it damages the retina, the blood supply to the retina, the small capillaries in the retina, and it causes eye damage that way. It damages the small blood vessels nourishing the nerves, and it affects the longest nerves first, which are the nerves going to the feet. It can also um, uh, harm the small capillaries going into the filtering system of the kidneys. So um, you can get, and here are the terms, diabetic retinopathy, the small blood vessels of the retina, uh, nephropathy, which is the kidney damage, or neuropathy, which is the nerve damage. And microalbuminuria is a tiny leakage of protein into the urine. This precedes uh, diabetic nephropathy. And what this landmark study showed, and it was done in type 1 diabetics living in North America, and it was conducted really in the 1980s, 
it showed that if you controlled your hemoglobin A1C and you kept it less than 7, your relative risk of, in, of diabetes complications was quite low. If you had an A1C of 9, your relative risk of complications, we'll take retinopathy for example, was five times higher. If you got up to around 10, an A1C of 10, it's nine times higher. So when you move your A1C from 10 to 11 to 12, your risk of complications goes up quite steeply. And below eight, you're looking pretty good, below seven, even better. So they picked the target to control the A1C by keeping it less than seven based on this diabetes control and complications trial. <coughs> It just gave us a target uh, to know how we're doing with our diabetes patients in terms of preventing complications. So 1995, again, 1970s, metformin was taken off the market. It was the biguanide discovered from the French lilac plant. It comes back on the market, again termed glucophage or sugar eater, and it is a blockbuster diabetes drug, okay? This, is, this drug is still being used today. It is the cornerstone of treatment of type 2 diabetes. It is our first-line drug. Studies come and go with other drugs and nasty <coughs> side effects. And with this drug, we only ever hear good news. So this is our tried and true, been on the market a long time, less weight gain. It does not cause dangerously low blood sugars. And it has a fairly good cardiovascular risk profile meaning that people on this drug tend to have less cardiovascular events compared to being on that sulfonylurea class of drugs. Skip ahead to 1996. This is when we have the first analog insulin. And what is an analog insulin? This is uh, an insulin that's been modified to have a different action profile. It's a synthetic insulin produced by changing these two amino acids to lysine and proline, hence the name Lispro. And the nice thing about this insulin is that it changed the action profile from human insulin to something that works quicker. So if you take Lispro just before your meal, it's gonna start working in five to 10 minutes. If you take regular insulin, it does not start working for 30 minutes. So typically a type one diabetic has to plan their meal, count their carbs, decide on their dose, so they're going to dose their insulin and then decide on what they eat. That's not going to work too well. So with this insulin, you could plan your meal, know your meal, know your carbs, dose, and eat really quickly. Skip ahead to 2005. This was an interesting discovery. This is a picture of a Gila monster, or maybe it's called Gila monster. I don't know whether the G is silent or not. But when they were looking at the venomous saliva of the Gila monster, they found a substance called GLP-1 or a substance called exenatide. And that substance was later used in a diabetes drug. So let me tell you a little bit about GLP-1. So here in the middle, we see GLP-1. GLP-1 is produced by the cells of the small intestine. When we eat, food goes th through our mouth, obviously, into our esophagus, into our stomach, and, s and goes into the small intestine. Once it hits the small intestine, we produce a substance called GLP-1. That substance does several things in our body. Number one, it tells the pancreas, hey, pancreas, make more insulin. I need insulin because my person is eating. It also tells the pancreas, make less glucagon. And the glucagon has the impact on telling the liver to make less sugar and telling the muscle to increase its glucose uptake. Not only does GLP-1 work on the pancreas, it, uh, it also has a couple other desirable effects. Number one, it slows gastric emptying. So when we eat, things stay in our stomach longer. So we feel fuller quicker. And actually, they did studies in type 2 diabetics that showed that type 2 diabetics don't make enough of this substance. So it makes sense to give it back, right? That's, a, that's really one of the things we do all day long. We have a diabetes patient, a type 1, that doesn't make insulin, we give it back. We give them insulin. So it's fairly similar with this GLP-1 stuff. Whoops, whoop. sorry about that. Another effect of GLP-1 is it works on the brain. It helps raise the hormones associated with satiety. It makes us feel fuller. It also may give us a little bit of nausea, which is helpful with this drug because people generally lose weight on it. And it's also felt to have some cardioprotective and cardiac function benefits. 
So after the Gila monster, we had the drug Bietta, which is exenatide. That's in a pen. It was a twice-a-day injection. They later turned that into Bidorian, which is a once-weekly injection. Now, how did they do that? They actually attach the molecule exenatide onto an absorbable suture that's very tiny. And you inject that under your skin, and it slowly releases the drug so that it lasts a week. Another GLP-1 agonist is Victoza or Liraglutide. They all end in tide or eyed. And um, new ones just keep coming out. This one, Ozempic, literally just came out within the past two months. And then we also have Trulicity. You're probably just picturing all the ads in your head when you watch TV, you see all these ads. But you can think of the Gila monster uh, the next time you see a GLP-1 agonist. So we talked about GLP-1, right? And GLP-1 is broken down by an enzyme called DPP-4, right? So DPP-4 breaks down GLP-1. You would have low GLP-1 levels. But what if you inhibit this enzyme? Then you'd have higher GLP-1 levels. And then you'd have more downstream effects of GLP-1 like we talked about on the last slide. So in 2006, we had the DPP-4 inhibitors. We have Genuvia, Ungliza, and Trigenta. They are citagliptin, saxagliptin, and linagliptin. Those are the glyptin class, the DPP-4 inhibitors. Now, I like these drugs because they're very straightforward, simple, no real side effects. We don't have to worry about nausea, low blood sugar. They're pretty much weight neutral. So you know, if you want something easy with less side effects, this is, this is an easy drug to take. Now, it's not a big bang. The lowering of your blood sugar is, uh, it lowers your A1C about 0.8%, and there are other drugs that are more effective. But if, you know, my patients are very worried about side effects and they don't want something that's going to get in their way during the day, and this is a good choice in that regard. So skip forward to 2013, um, the FDA approves the SGLT2 inhibitors. So these you probably see all over the TV. These are the Jardians, the Invocana, and the Farsiga. So what we have here is uh, the, the bloodstream, right? Blood flow is coming in here with glucose in it. Glucose goes into the nephron and then into the collecting tubule of the kidney. Now SGLT2, is a channel that helps the sugar go back into the bloodstream so you don't lose all your sugar in the urine. So if you inhibit SGLT2, less sugar goes back into the bloodstream and more sugar stays in the urine. And so you just pee out more sugar. Um, it's kind of like a diuretic effect that brings sugar with it. Now, what are the downsides to that? So anytime you have sugar somewhere, you're at increased risk for infection. So the main downside to this class of medication is increased risk of urinary tract infections because bacteria and yeast like sugar. So in women, you know, that happens at a rate of about 20% of all comers that take this medication. In men, that's less likely because they have longer urethras. But it's a great class of medication. It lowers the A1C about 1%. It's very effective. Downside is you may pee a bit more. Um, but, uh, but it is a drug that, you know, another choice that we have, and it's very effective, and we're happy to have it. And it's fairly new in the past five years or so. So as we can see, the Farsiga, the Jardians, and the Invocana, think about your, your commercials now. So back to insulin, right? This is the insulin molecule. We have a beta chain and an alpha chain and disulfide binds. We, we talked about changing a few amino acids to change the action profile to get a quicker short-acting insulin. But what about the long-acting insulins? We, we talked, we alluded to them earlier when we talked about the neutral protamine hegedorn or NPH insulin. That was the one where we added zinc and protamine to make the insulin lo last longer. So we have several long-acting insulins on the market now. In 2000, Glargine or Lantus came out. In 2004, Detamir or Levamir came out. In 2015, we had a souped up version of Lantus called 2 And in 2016, we have Degladec or Traceba. Now, how do these insulins work? They, they all work a little bit differently, but the, the point is you inject the insulin, 
they start to precipitate out these hexamers, right? These hexamers that are initially clustered together. And over time, these hexamers break down into dimers and then monomers. And these little monomers then go into the bloodstream. And this happens slowly over time so that you get a continuous infusion of these monomers working in your body that give you an action profile of long-acting insulin that lasts 24 hours. Now, in the case of 2JO, the action profile is probably about 30 hours. With Traceba, it's probably about 40 hours, which is, which is amazing. So Traceba, they did a study. Now, typically, if, you, if you're taking Lantus, which lasts 24 hours, and you are supposed to take it every night at 8 p.m., right? But one night, you, you delay taking it till 12 p.m. Those four hours with Lantus, you're not getting any insulin, right? So you can imagine that the blood sugars would rise in that scenario. With Traceba, when the action profile is longer, like 40 hours, you could actually miss your Lantus shot that night, take it the next morning, and you'd continue to have coverage with your background insulin. So that is a nice, uh, a nice, uh, a nice thing to have for our forgetful patients, of which we, we do have a few. So now we'll get to some of the exciting part of, uh, of, of the treatment of diabetes and maybe, maybe the most exciting part of the, uh, of the talk. We're going to talk about insulin pumps. Um, so what are insulin pumps? Let me just grab one here. So this is an insulin pump. This is the Medtronic insulin pump, but they're all about the same. Within this pump, you have a reservoir, which is here and that's what holds your insulin. This pump delivers two types of, it delivers one insulin, you only put short-acting insulin in this pump, but it gives you a basal rate, a continuous infusion of insulin. It's called a basal rate, and you could say, for example, you're getting one unit per hour of insulin in this thing. You can program it to whatever setting you want, and it can change such that from eight to 12, you're getting one unit per hour, but from 12 to four, you're getting one and a half units per hour and you can change over the course of 24 hours. And then when you're eating, all you have to do is enter your carbohydrates and your blood sugar and it will calculate a bolus dose of insulin for you. Um, so it initially in the 1960s were when insulin pumps were first discovered. It's quite amazing here that this is the first insulin pump by Arnold Kadish. It was about the size of a marine backpack, and it was worn on the back, and you can tell it probably wasn't too convenient. And then in 1978, we had the next insulin pump, which was called the Big Blue Brick. That also was, was not uh, too convenient. It was also large and cumbersome. But in 1983, we had a pump made by Medtronic or Minimed, that doesn't look all that different from the pump that I just held up and the pumps that you can come and see a bit later. So that's the Minimed, the first insulin pump that looks like the pumps today back in 1983. So now we have three pumps on the market, three pump companies. So we have the Medtronic pump, which is this one, which is the one I actually held up here. We have the Tandem insulin pump or T-Slim insulin pump. Now these are both tubing pumps. So you have a tube that goes to an infusion set and you have a little IV type thing, a, a little catheter that's sitting under your skin and constantly infusing the insulin. Well, this little infusion set stays there, but you can disconnect as this person has. You're going to take a shower or you're going in the ocean, you disconnect your insulin pump. Now during that time you would not have insulin, but you could go do what you need to do and not get your pump wet. So we have the tubing insulin pumps, and then we also have the Omnipod insulin pump. You load the insulin into this pod. This pod is then put on your stomach or the back of the arm, you could wear it, or you could wear it on your leg, but people tend to do stomach. And on the back side of this is a little catheter or cannula, right? And through that little cannula, the insulin gets infused. Now you control your basal rates and your dose of insulin with this little PDM device. So I'm gonna hold that up for you now. So here we have the Omnipod. You can see it's quite small, it's pretty flat. 
could easily be put down on, on your stomach and, you know, for the ladies in the room, no one would really notice it. And men that were worried about it, maybe they wouldn't notice it either. And then this is the PDM device, about the size, a little smaller than an iPhone. And with this device, you dose your insulin. What about continuous glucose monitors? Now these are, uh, they've probably been on the market about maybe 12, 15 years. And how these work is you have a glucose sensor, which is a tiny wire, and I have examples of this as well if you want to see them later. It senses interstitial glucose, so it senses the glucose between the cells. Now, it's not sensing capillary glucose, which is our gold standard, but interstitial glucose is quite close to capillary glucose. So it's a surrogate indicator, and it tends to track very closely with capillary glucose, although it's not measuring capillary glucose. It senses your blood sugar. It sends the information to a transmitter, which then can send the information to a couple places. Um, it can send the information to a pump, where you can read out your blood sugar on a screen, or in the case of Dexcom, it can show your blood sugar on your iPhone, which is pretty amazing. So you can get, uh, you can open your, your app for Dexcom on your phone and see what your blood sugar is without having to check your blood sugar. And the way this works and the way you keep it accurate is you have to enter two blood sugars into this device to make sure it's accurate, two blood sugars per day. Each sensor lasts about, lasts seven days. It's worn on the abdomen. It's not supposed to be worn at other sites, although people do it and say that it's accurate. When you initially put it on, it takes two hours till you're really going to get accurate information from it. But in the case of a type 1 diabetic or a child with diabetes, you can actually share the information with the parent. Or in the case of a kid going off to college, you can see your son or daughter's blood sugars and know that they're all right. And also, if, you're, if your son or daughter is dropping too low or rising too high, it buzzes at you or alerts you. And sometimes we have patients that don't sense their low blood sugars, and it's very helpful for them to get a warning when their blood sugar is, is low. The latest uh, pump, I'm, I'm sorry, the latest sensor that came out on the market is the Abbott Libre. This one has probably been out about three, four months. This sensor goes on the back of the arm, and it's worn for 10 days, a little bit longer than the Dexcom. The startup time is 12 hours, so you put it on and it does nothing for you for 12 hours. But after that 12 hours, you get 10 days out of it. It does not alarm at you, but when you wave the reader on the back of your arm, you can see what your blood sugar is and what your trend is. So you can see in this picture, this person had a blood sugar of 112, and they were kind of on the rise, as indicated by this arrow. So incredibly helpful for people that don't want to check their blood sugar and prick their finger four or five, six times a day. But not giving you the alarms when you're high or low is the downside to that <laughs> sensor. So what about artificial pancreas technology? So back about, it's probably about eight months, maybe a year now, Medtronic came out with this technology. And what it means when someone says they have artificial pancreas technology is that the sensor talks to the pump and does things without the patient's involvement. Um, it does not do everything, right? You still have to do something. So you wear a sensor on one part of your abdomen, and again, a little wire sticking under your body. And you wear a pump site preferably on different sides of your abdomen, right? And when you dose your insulin, let's give an example at a meal, you dose your, your insulin for your food. If you guess wrong and your sugar is dropping low, the pump, without your knowledge, reduces delivery of basal insulin. So the pump knows you're running low from the sensor and reduces your, your basal rate during that time. By the same token, if you guess wrong and deliver too little insulin and your blood sugar is high, the pump can raise basal rate delivery. Now, you still have to enter your carbs, take your doses at meal, but if you get it wrong, there's a safeguard in place. It also has an ability to suspend if you're running low. 
So if you're having low blood sugars and you don't know it, you don't hear the alarms, you don't do anything about it, it's going to suspend insulin delivery for two hours. Now, all of those features of this pump only happen when you're in something called auto mode. And so there are some things you have to do. The sensor has to warm up for a bit, and then you enter into this auto mode. So it's, it's not working like that all the time. But my patients that are on the device, and it is relatively new, so we don't have a lot of experience with it, generally spend like 90 95% of their time in auto mode. And if we look here at this person's sugar graph, so this is the 200 mark. This is, uh, this is 120. And you can see in auto mode, what we do is we, we don't spike as high, right? And we don't drop as low, and it just lowers the, the, devi the standard deviation such that you spent more time within range. Now it does that by going into auto mode. So it is incredibly helpful for the people that can be 300 or can be 60 at any time point during the day because they're very brittle, as we say. It helps keep them from reaching those extremes. And by doing that, we're seeing um, lowering of A1C with more people getting into target range. So we have back to the future here. I don't know if this speaks to anybody, but we're supposed to be doing flying cars by now, but we're not. So um, what is the future of diabetes technology? Um, what is the future of diabetes in the treatment of, uh, I'll focus on type 1 diabetes as we talked about that for a lot of the talk. Um, so the future is, is hopefully, you know, a cure for this disease, right? So kids don't, you know, stop making insulin and need a gazillion shots and devices attached to them. But until we have that, we're really focusing on technology, and I'm going to end with, um, with, with a little tidbit on the technology that's on the horizon. So the thing that's being studied now, and there have been studies since 2013, is something called the bionic pancreas. Now, how is that different from the artificial pancreas? The bionic pancreas is a dual chamber pump, which is over here with these two little chambers, that gives both insulin and glucagon. And it has a computer program in here that adjusts based on the sensor data whether or not you're getting gluc glucagon or insulin. And it does this without you having to do anything. You don't have to enter carbs. You don't have to, you don't have to do anything, OK? Um, now, this is the holy grail because it's, you know, you're free. You're free from diabetes uh, for, you know, as long as you're on this device, which, which sounds pretty good. And it was studied by um, a biomedical engineer at Boston University. And as you can imagine, most of this work is being done by people who have kids with diabetes. So this gentleman was, uh, was inspired by the fact that his kid had diabetes. And his kid was going to eventually have to go off to college. And he was going to worry during that time. And so he wanted some sort of technology in place so that he could sleep better at night while his kid was off at college. And so the initial version of it involved a Dexcom sensor, this, um, this receiver device, which then sent the information to this bionic pancreas, which is the computer program, which then directed these two pumps. And they used these two T-slim pumps in the original iteration. So one of these pumps had glucagon, and the other pump had insulin in it. And the computer drove the data from the sensor data. And the, the one that's being studied now and is in clinical trials but not yet available is going to be the eyelet, where they pull uh, both. Uh, the, you don't have to wear two pumps. It's one pump with two chambers. So the eyelet is going to be the next uh, version of the biotic, bionic pancreas. So I'm going to end with a video from the people working on the, biotic, the bionic pancreas. And um, I really hope you enjoy it, because I know I do. It really gives me a sense for what kids with diabetes go through. And I think it's, it's pretty eye-opening. So I'm going to go ahead and start it. I hope the, the audio is good. Let's see here. These are the test subjects. And these are the most grueling tests that we could design. What is happening at these camps is an outpatient trial of an innovative technology in the early stages of development that could really change the game for people with type 1 diabetes. Type 1 
diabetes is a condition in which the pancreas stops making insulin, which is a hormone that lowers blood sugar. And when this happens, people with type 1 diabetes have to manage their blood sugar manually. So they need to check their blood sugar frequently by pricking their skin. And they need to give themselves doses of insulin, either with an insulin pump or a needle. The challenge is to maintain near normal blood sugar levels, but while at the same time minimizing exposure to very low blood sugars, which are acutely dangerous. And to think about the amount of glucose in your blood, day in and day out, hour after hour after hour, is an absurd and impossible task. It is the only disease that I know of where you are making dosing decisions with a, with a medicine that can kill you if you get it wrong. And you're doing those decisions 24-7. We're trying to build a system that as much as possible does not require the person with diabetes to even know what their blood sugars are. This is my biotic pancreas, but we have a name for it. It's called the BioPanky. To keep it more fun, because diabetes can be fun. I call it the pancreas, the fake pancreas. Um, the front of it is an iPhone that runs the software that they designed, and the back of it is a continuous glucose monitor. The bionic pancreas takes a measurement of blood sugar every five minutes, and then makes a decision without involving the person with diabetes in that decision about how much insulin or glucagon to give, regulating their blood sugar 24 hours a day, including at night when they're sleeping or when they're distracted. The T1D program of the Hound St. Charitable Trust aims to accelerate the development of tools and devices to ease the burden of living with T1D. One of the important roles at the Trust is to facilitate collaboration amongst grantees across the T1D landscape. And the Bionic Pancreas study is a great example of that. It's bringing together an exciting new technology and development with the great work that's being done at these camps. This camp specifically, Claire Martin camp, is for young women, and the Jocelyn camp is for young boys, and then all together we make up the Barton Organization for Diabetes Education. We're trying to make people live well with diabetes. First star really big deal here. So we make a big announcement in the dining hall, so-and-so did their shot, and they're like the first time. So-and-so did this or that. Kids can just really be kids. to start the violent pancreas on eight girls. Eight of you are on usual care this week, and the other eight are on closed loop control, and you'll be completely controlled by the device for the next five days. Is everybody ready? Questions. If you, I think we take a break, right? And then we do questions, or up to you. Up, 
up to me. Well, I feel like we're, did you guys enjoy the video? It's pretty amazing, right? Yeah. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Yes. Yeah, just kind of. Oh, oh well, we got a protocol here. Wait, wait, where I can yell. No, no. That's it. No, no. <laughs> Informative. Um, a lot of information here, but as, I, as we went through it, 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 I hate to use the word artificial, but whether it's inhibitors or medicine, you know, what about the cure? Can you comment on advances or hurdles as we look to fix the pancreas itself? Yeah, so um, the main issue with, um, so there, there are beta cells that you can infuse and put into, you basically uh, inject them into the portal circulation and then they go to the liver um, and they kind of get embedded in there. But my understanding of that is it's only done in extreme circumstances. So people who are suffering with their diabetes. Now how do you suffer with diabetes bad enough to warrant an aggressive treatment that may have some side effects that could be dangerous? Um, Really bad diabetes is when you have horrible hypoglycemia that you walk around and you don't even know you have. And so people that were having dangerous hypoglycemia where they would pass out, you know, for example, behind a car or you know, doing things, you know, have seizures with low blood sugars, now, now we have, now we have you know, the continuous glucose monitors, so that happens less often. But um, you know that is not that's done in the research setting, and um, you know it's not ready for prime time yet. The other thing that they're trying to work on is if you if you gave someone beta cells, or you could package up the cells that make insulin and somehow put them in somebody's pancreas. How do you keep um, that autoimmune process from destroying that little package of cells? And so the latest research is to bind those cells up and keep those, the, the immune system cells from attacking them. And my understanding is there are, they are making some advances there. If you want to know more about it, you would go to uh, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. They're, the mission of that organization is to find a cure for type 1 diabetes, but that, that's really the work that's being done. Um, I found the plea. Um, in, interesting that showed all the medications and you said that uh, typical of the patients that you see. And I understand diet and exercise are, are very important, but are there medications, um, typically statins, that long-term use can actually affect your A1C or your insulin sensitivity? So you're talking about medicines that my patients might be on that's making their sugars higher? Like in the, the case of statins? Okay, so statins are actually proven to, to increase your background blood sugar a bit. Now for some people that are walking around with an A1C of, let's say for example 6.3, you put them on a statin and now they're 6.5, in that case, yes, you cause diabetes, right? Because at 6.3 they were pre-diabetic, at 6.5 they're suddenly diabetic. But um, statins are a medicine that raise blood sugar. So your question is what other medicines raise blood sugar? So a, a classic example would be steroids. So people that have to take chronic steroids um, like prednisone or Medrol, that's another medication that, that raises blood sugar and can cause diabetes. What was the last part of the question? We're good. So no one's walking back with the microphone. I, I More questions. The mic. <coughs> so the next one. Um, I have sure. two, two questions. Uh, how much are those pumps, and does uh, are they paid for by insurance? Is part one. Okay. Yep. So the original insulin pumps, so the ones that we showed on. The, these pumps here, um, out-of-pocket costs, it will vary by plan. So I actually don't know what they would cost out-of-pocket, but I would assume it would be a large sum of money, maybe a couple thousand dollars. But for every type 1 diabetic, any plan, including Medicaid, these pumps are covered. 
Now on Medicaid, you can get a pump, but you, do, you cannot get a sensor, even if you're a type one diabetic. And my second question is for type two, go to the type two now. Mm -hmm. So if your parent and your grandparent um, had type two diabetes, what is the preventative or course of action that yeah. people should be taking to see what what's happening to them? So uh, I'm not big on um, fad diets or there, there's no certain diet. You don't need to do low carb. You just need to do a healthy diet, which is to me, you know, I, I, hate, to, I hate the diets that eliminate some sort of food group, right? Gluten-free, vegan. Healthy things are healthy. So you want to do lean proteins, lean meats, fruits and vegetables. Try to avoid things from bags or boxes. Um, and, and, you know, I don't think dairy is bad. I think dairy is actually pretty good. So your Greek yogurts, your milk, you know, and then I'm a big proponent of counting calories. So um, if, you know, if you want to reduce your risk of diabetes, you basically, and you are overweight or obese, you want to lose five to 10% of your body weight. So if you're 180 pounds, that's a weight loss of just nine pounds for 5%. So just really work towards lowering your weight and aiming for a five to 10% weight loss. And then also exercising. Now the American Diabetes Association recommends 30 minutes of exercise five days a week, which is a daunting task even for myself. So any amount of exercise, I usually encourage my patients to start very slow. Map out your week, find 20 minutes three days a week and start there. What you're gonna find is you enjoy it. It's a good stress relief. You can tell your family members to leave you alone for 20 minutes while you go and exercise. And then from there, go ahead and add to it. So you work up to the five days a week. But that's your best bet for preventing diabetes. And even sometimes in that scenario, the genes prevail and you get it anyway. Hi, um, I wanted to say thank you for your presentation today. And um, I would like to pursue a career in pediatric endocrinology. What kind of advice would you give to a student who wants to pursue a career in this field? Okay. Um, so where are you right now in your, your, your training, so to speak? Are you in high school or college? Or? Yes, I'm in high school. Okay. So, I mean, so you have to, you know, go to college. You have to do well, take your MCATs and then do medical school. I would, I would encourage you to get involved at um, AI DuPont Hospital for Children. We're very lucky to have that close by. You know, so do some volunteer work, possibly do some research. Um, and uh, you know, work, work hard at it. And I would, I would say stay connected to children. Um, I think that would look good on your resume. And um, yeah, that, that would be a good starting point. Is there any stem cell research be done to rejuvenate the pancreas? Yeah, so I, I think there are early phases of stem cell research. My understanding is it's not ready for prime time just yet. Yeah. I just had a quick question. I am a school nurse, and I sure. do have a student on an Omnipod with a Dexcom, which is, was fantastic. It was yeah. a lifesaver for him, because he was always in the 30s and couldn't tell. Yeah. But he just couldn't tell. Um, is there any research on the artificial pancreas being studied for pancreatic cancer? I lost my mom to pancreatic cancer and... Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of patients with pancreatic cancer do, you know, if they have a Whipple procedure or they have a resective procedure, they do end up with diabetes, but I'm not, I'm not uh, sure of any research being done in that setting. But anything that would work for a type 1 diabetic would work in that setting. Unfortunately, the prognosis in pancreatic cancer is very poor. So even if you do control the blood sugars or make life easier during that time, you know, the, the, big, the big splash with outcomes is, is going to be difficult. Um, hi, I'm Bryce McDowell. I'm a sophomore at a high school. And uh, my question is, is it possible to not produce enough insulin and be insulin resistant at the same time, or is it one or the other? Yes, yes, so um, a good example is that, let's take a 50-year-old um, type two diabetic, right? Um, they're on pills and they're not particularly, actually we'll make them, they're obese. 
And over time, they're, like in that example, the pancreas is working so hard, having to make such high insulin levels because they're resistant to the insulin. And eventually, over time, your beta cell function, your, your cells that produce insulin, they drop off and die. So if you've had diabetes for 10, 15, 20 years, your risk of becoming insulin deficient actually goes up. So oftentimes, in long-standing type 2 diabetes, people reach a point where their body really goes kaput in making insulin. So at that point, they're both insulin deficient and insulin resistant. Okay. Good evening. Hi. Oh, there. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we enjoyed your, your lecture tonight, and thank you. Oh, thank you. I just would like to go back to the diet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in the film, in the slides, uh, they kept referring to carbs. You're referring to calorie counting. So which do we do, calories or okay. carbs? So in a, in a type 1 diabetes setting, um, the main determinant of how high your blood sugar spikes after the meal is the carbs in the diet. So not only is it the, it's, it's the carbs in the diet, but also the type of carbs, right? So starches take longer to break down, and you might have high blood sugars later. Uh, simple sugars will spike you really quick right off the bat. So that's why in the video they're talking about carbohydrates because you use your carbohydrate amount to determine your insulin dose. Um, for me, in terms of weight loss, um, low carbohydrate diets are actually very uh, effective at weight loss. Think of the Atkins diet. People lose a lot of weight on it. The problem is it's difficult to stay on that long term and people wonder whether it's safe. So for me, if you're a type 2 diabetic and you're trying to lose weight, I would calorie count, and, and low carb is effective. Um, when you do low carb, you basically eliminate all the junk food, right? I mean, you can't have cookies, crackers, cakes. You limit pasta, you limit bread. So you limit a lot of things that aren't very good for you, and, and that's another way that it's effective. I had a question about how you protect um, the pump on the abdomen with um, you know teenagers playing sports and all. I know on my son's basketball team there's a boy that wears one of these and I'm just amazed that he can do all he does. So. Yeah, so it's really difficult. So it's a small catheter that's under your skin and then it's taped down. Um, the boy on your son's team may disconnect from his insulin pump while he plays basketball. And um, the concern there is if you disconnect for longer than, remember we talked about the insulin lasting in your body about four hours, the short acting insulin. If you disconnect for longer than four hours, you're gonna have no insulin working in your body and you'd get in trouble. But it's, it's very, t back to the infusion set, it's taped down pretty well. And I mean, it stays in pretty well, but you know, you do hear about people pulling it out and it's a, it's a bear when you pull it out or it's a bear when you, when it falls out or gets pulled out and you don't know it, it is, and during that time, your sugars go straight up because you basically eliminated all insulin delivery from your body and you didn't know it, and you go into something called diabetic ketoacidosis, and that is a risk with the pump. Now, since sensors have come to market, your sensor, your Dexcom, would be buzzing at you and you know, you'd know know that possibly there, there was a problem with insulin delivery. So. That's the nice thing about having the pump with the sensor. But they do fall off, the kids, but, but they, they're still a great option for kids. You just have to be a little careful. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I had two questions. The first question was with the um, artificial pancreas that was on the screen. Is that device that's on you waterproof? Yeah, uh, the device, meaning the the... This thing, this computer thing. Um, yeah, I would, like I would, if, I would want, if they wanted to go swimming. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure of the answer to that. When we go back to traditional pumps, um, if you were wearing an Omnipod with just the pod, yes, it's waterproof. You can go underwater with it. Right. And uh, these pumps can't get wet, though. The T Slim and the, the actual box, these things can't get wet. Um, my second question is. Does your practice um, mention at all pancreas transplants? No, it's not something available here at Christiana Care. Um, the closest centers, the really pancreas transplants are only being done in people that need kidneys and pancreases. 
because it's you know a big operation to do a pancreas transplant so if you're doing a kidney at the same time it seems worth the risk and um, closest centers are UPenn and also University of Maryland I'm not sure about Hopkins but I know um, Maryland and Penn are doing them Yes. My question on the, the chart, the great presentation, thank you very much. The thank question you. on the chart that you showed, if you have the average here with the A1C, sure. would, would be, is, can, is that available somewhere online for more detail? Because uh -huh. I, I have one, and I take, I take the measurement twice a day, and the A1C once every three months, yep. and don't seem to get it right. Meaning that your the blood sugars you check on your on your finger don't match up with your A1C. Right, not I mean okay. close, but close, um, right. So A1C, we talked about the methodology of the test, right? So you're measuring glucose attached to the red blood cell, and that happens at a standard rate in a non-diabetic. And when you go up and you get more glucose attached, it's a, actually a percentage. So. So basically, it's an average of all points in time over the past three months. And when you check your finger, unless you're checking it 24 times a day, which would be every hour, it wouldn't exactly correlate. So there are times when you don't check your sugar and you may spike high. You don't stay high for too long, but you spike high and it impacts your A1C. But you're not, you're not checking enough numbers to have it exactly correlate. But for people that check four times a day, it correlates pretty well. So if I have pizza and don't check, it probably. <laughs> okay. Um, so I have a couple questions. Sure. I I'm not diabetic, at least not right now. <laughs> um, so how do you, when you talk, you're talking about measuring carbohydrates, if I were to go out to lunch or dinner, how would I measure those? How would I know exactly what I'm getting as far as carbohydrates are concerned? Yeah. That's so there's a. Um, yeah. Number one, so there's a, an app, it's an app now, but it started as a book called um, Calorie King. And if, so if you went to that or typed it in a search engine, it would get you the app and it's called Calorie King. And so you could estimate the amount of carbs in your diet. And, and it also has like, you know, the common chain restaurants. Um, there are other resources online where you might be able to, you know, you, for example, I know that one slice of white bread is 15 grams of carb, and you know there are standard amounts of carbs that are just known that you could probably easily look up on Google. And the other question, going back to transplants, um, I'm, I'm actually a kidney transplant patient okay. and, and looking to get a second kidney at some point in the future. Um, and I have heard with a second kidney um, that you can end up getting diabetes. Mm -hmm. Is it type one or type two? And, and I've also heard that um, for, for a lot of people, it eventually goes away, um, but for yeah. some it doesn't. <laughs> so it's primarily mediated through the steroids that are part of the rejection meds, and um, they raise your blood sugar, they make you more insulin resistant, so it's primarily type two diabetes. But at times, that does eventually cause insulin deficiency where you end up looking more like a type 1 and needing insulin. But it's mostly type 2, initially treated with pills. In the transplant setting, there's a higher rate of needing insulin. Yes. Uh, I am diabetic uh, type 2, and I have been on a combination of uh, uh, medicines for the past several years. I take metformin in the morning, in the evening, and at lunchtime I take Trajinta. Right. And uh, monitoring my A1C, um, I notice that there is a creep, you know. Mm -hmm. Time with diabetes. Is it yeah. time to change that uh, treatment or what? What do you recommend? So what you're seeing is that is what we described for this young man here is that over time your body gets tired of making so much insulin and how you deal with that is needing more medication. I would say is it time for more medication? It depends on what the A1C is. If your goal is to keep it less than seven and you're above seven, then I would say yes. This is and Right. So, you know, the American College of Physicians just came out and said, you know what, we're, we're going to be okay with an A1C anywhere between seven and eight, whereas 
the American Diabetes Association wants your A1C less than 7. If we go back to these, the graph from the DCCT, you can see between 7 and 8, if we look at complications right at 7, it's there between complications at 8, there's not a great difference. So that's where that, that, that information, that recommendation to, to be okay with 8. Um, to me, it would depend on how long you're going to live with diabetes, and no one has a crystal ball. But basically, it takes time for A1C or high sugars to damage your body. Like it takes like 10 or 20 years. So you know, if you're close to 7.1, and you're not going to be around for 50 years, for example, we'd probably be okay with the 7.1. Um, sorry. Um, oh, my question was. Sure. Um, what are some biological reasons why certain populations, such as uh, South Asians and African Americans, are more at risk for developing uh, type 2 diabetes? Um, you know, lifestyle factors, socioeconomic status, all else being, being equal. Being equal, yeah. Um, exact reason for that, I, you know, I really didn't. That's, that's known, as you said, that they're at higher risk. Um, what is the genetic defect? Um, I'm not aware of what it is. Um, but you speak to a good point. It does have to do with socioeconomic disparities and access to health care. All those things definitely play a role. Um, another thing is um, some of those cultures are more prone to obesity. Um, so that may also be a factor. But if you said all things being equal, why, are the, why is there a higher rate? I'm not aware of the why of that. That's a great question. Hi, I'm a pre-med student at UD, and I was looking into being uh, doing pediatrics. And I was just wondering, at what age do you guys start um, like putting the insulin pumps into children, and like at what age do you start noticing symptoms of diabetes? And what age can you detect it? Sorry, so you, long question. Yeah, so sometimes it's detected in, in babies and in infants and in newborns. Um, and I don't treat um, infants or even pediatrics, but my understanding is that the insulin pump uh, gives you a lot of flexibility on dosing and it's very effective and helpful, and plus it reduces your shot burden. So that little site gets changed every three days. So you take a kid with diabetes, now it does involve a shot to put in that site, but you're going from four shots a day to one shot to put that in every three days. So my understanding is they, they use the pumps in, in very young patients. Um, I don't know exactly how young. One little tidbit of information that I found out while you all were asking questions <clears throat> is that <clears throat> not that I would recommend it. You could go onto eBay and you could buy a used insulin pump for $591. So that gives you a sense of how much they probably uh, cost brand new. The other little thing is that uh, Dr. Kate Smith, who, who's helping with the microphone, and I attended a conference uh, just last week uh, where the keynote uh, presenter was talking about the promise of genomics. Uh, and the, the larger the human gene map we do, especially including people who are not white Euro European individuals, the, the broader we get that map, the more deeply we understand the relationship between gene map and then the outcomes in healthcare uh, and, and what we can do with healthcare outcomes. So, anyway, Kate, any more on? Questions on your end? Okay, go. Yeah, actually, one more. So we're going full circle on sure. back. Uh, pregnancy related diabetes. Um, you talk a little bit about that. We didn't really discuss it during the presentation. Sure. I, my son had asked me, hey, yep. did mom yep. have diabetes with me? I was like, yeah, with both my sons. It yep. came and then it went. Yeah, so time? it's gestational diabetes. What are the risk factors? So um, obesity, advanced age, family history of diabetes, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is. Um, a syndrome where your body makes too much male hormone compared to female hormone and it causes insulin resistance, which is the precursor for type 2. So those are the, those are the main risk factors. Um, treatment is insulin. So the only... Now some, some oral meds, particularly um, sulfonylureas and metformin, have been studied um, in pregnancy. Um, Glyburide can be used in pregnancy and is used by the maternal fetal medicine docs here at Christiana. 
As endocrinologists, um, we feel insulin is the most effective treatment during pregnancy. And basically, the treatment involves, initially, if you could do it by diet, the point is to keep your fasting blood sugar less than 90 and your one-hour post-meal blood sugar less than 130. And it's, it's pretty hard, depending on how much you're affected by the gestational diabetes. Another point about gestational diabetes is it's mediated through the placental hormones. So we feel the placental hormones are the key piece in causing worsening insulin resistance and causing the diabetes to show up in pregnancy. And how good you do at keeping your blood sugars within that parameter determines how well the baby does, whether the baby gets large, um, whether the baby has low blood sugar after, after delivery and those sort of complications. All right, well, I'm happy to show anyone. I can probably stay for about a half hour. If anyone wants to see any of the gadgets, you can come on up. I'm happy to show you, and thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks very much, Dr.